Welcome to Fright Night. From the light of the sun A nasty burn now isn't that fun Swim in the ocean, run on the beach Drown in the surf and blood like a lynch We have no time for merry-making Chop off the head for badness sake Sell for a limb, batter and bake Nasty spells of bubonic night Come close and see what's hidden from sight Something festering in my bed Dancing on my hey everybody, welcome to Get Busy Watching. I'm your host, Honest Dan. Let's talk movies and welcome to my fourth and final Halloween special. Let's get started. See what's hidden from sight. Something festering in my bed, bed box dancing on my head. Ever offends and makes you scream. I want to die on Halloween. Halloween, Halloween. I want to die on Halloween Under the bridge of Goblin Waits She never sleeps or has a taste A young woman moves into her new remote home and is greeted by her friends for a housewarming celebration. Unbeknownst to them, they are stalked by killer man-goats. <laughs> Be real with yourself, just rename the title Naked Girls and Occasionally Killer Goats. Oh my god, there were so many titties and not enough blood. I was not prepared. I'm not at all convinced that this isn't some closet triple X flick. What with how much gratuitous full frontal nudity there is and half naked women are running around. As a filthy hetero cis male, I should be appreciative. And I kind of am but it would have been nice to know that going in. But fine, whatever. Boobage aside, what else can be said about this? Well, obviously it's an indie low budge project, so it feels almost heartless to pick on it. I won't harp on the acting as the only legit actress is main star Ariel Racine, while everyone else is some sort of model, be it Playboy or OnlyFans, sometimes both. I guess I wouldn't mind the shameless titillation if there was a balance of scantily clad women and slasher thrills, but it's so one-sided that it's difficult to get into. I'm sorry, Kane Hodder was the goat man? As in, Jason Voorhees? Kane Hodder? I suddenly hate this movie now. And that's about all that can be said about this. It's not even worth getting mad at. It's a 13-year-old boy's wet dream, so if that's your baggage, I mean, I judge you, but have at it, I guess. My honest rating for Kill Her Goats a week three out of five. Don't be such a pussy. I'm sorry that I don't like stupid horror movies with stupid naked chicks running around getting chased by chainsaws or whatever. <laughs> Tell me a story full of betrayal. Headless horsemen covered with snails. The Carpenter sisters are back. A new Ghostface killer has tracked them and their friends down for another series of grisly murders. <laughs> We have to finish the movie. Who gives a fuck about movies? While I still think that this movie has its own fair share of tropes that never really get addressed, I can't deny that I actually really had fun with this outing. I cannot get enough of the chemistry between Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega. They bounce off of each other so well and hold this entire thing up by themselves. Literally every other character is kind of just there by comparison, with the notable exception of Courtney Cox and the shocking inclusion of Hayden Panettiere. I never saw Scream 4, but I do appreciate seeing her in general. I definitely don't buy her as an FBI agent, but she still has a strong screen presence. Also, small little bit of warm fuzzies, the inclusion of Samara Weaving and Henry Zerny, a mini Ready or Not reunion, makes me want to watch that again. And I give credit that this does know how to really play with expectations and keep you guessing on who's getting axed off and who's getting out alive. The only things I still don't much care for are just how many times people get stabbed in the stomach repeatedly and brush it off like a stubbed toe. And while I'm sure a seventh scream is on the way, what with the solid reception this is getting, I really want to know what the hell this series is trying to accomplish with Sam teetering on becoming a murderer herself. I'm on board with everybody else. 
I'm on board with everyone else. Neve Campbell got friggin' robbed. Look, I'm not exactly a fan of this franchise. The only ones I've seen are the first one and the requel. Is that what we called it? The point is, is that I've always respected her. And I recognize that she's as much the face of Scream as Ghostface is. I hope when the seventh rolls around, they pony up something nice for her and we get a glorious return of Sydney Prescott. As it stands, the movie is pretty good and I do recommend it. My honest rating for Scream 6, a four out of five. Just like you're not gonna be able to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the path this sleepless night Feels so good to have a bad fright This woman abandoned her life and several years later has remarried into wealth and with a different name. However, two young people from her past have found her and throw her life into turmoil. Erase us! Before you were dead, it's no me! I'm not us! Boy, how do I explain this one? I have never seen a movie that I really didn't like, but think is wonderfully messed up. I don't hate it, but I really wanted to hate it. Yeah, this is a new one for me. <laughs> From the offset, main character Neve is supposed to be despicable, horridly unsatisfied with her life. She clearly wanted to live like a rich woman, but buried herself in debt. Refusing to own up to it, she ran away. Now comfortable in her new, more idyllic life, she is now the pompous, uptight perfectionist that she always was meant to be. What was that line from Castle again? Yeah, money mean, doesn't change who you are, it just magnifies your personality. But as soon as the young people enter the picture, everything becomes a garbled mess of satisfaction and seriously, what the hell is going on? Why is she having such an intense meltdown when she sees these two? She doesn't know who they are, a question you keep asking and grow increasingly more annoyed at not getting an answer. And when it's revealed who they are and it suddenly becomes a home invasion flick, the tension is certainly amped up. The acting is committed from the actors, I give it that. Both Jordan Myrie and Bucky Backray are intimidating in their own right, with Myrie in particular stealing the show for his sheer presence. But this family just lets them do awful shit without putting up a fight. Every second of the climax, you're screaming at the TV for them to do this or do that, something, but they never do. But that ending was admittedly deliciously twisted. This was something else, let me tell you. I don't think it's a good movie, but it does have its highlights. The acting and directing is really good, but the writing could really have used some polishing. I don't think you're missing much if you decide to not see it, but I do think that the ending made it all worthwhile. So if you have Netflix, I don't know, give it a go, see what you think. My honest rating for The Strays, a three out of five. I was totally unaware of what happened in the past with me. You I mean? Cheryl. <laughs> Something waiting down the hall. Watch your step, you'll have a great fall. M. Night Shyamalan's new flick based on the novel The Cabin at the End of the World. Four strangers force a wholesome family to make an impossible choice. Kill one of their own or let the apocalypse happen. I mean, we're normal people just like you. We have no choice. There's always a choice! Well, that's rare for Shyamalan, a straightforward movie. <laughs> um, it's not the best that he's put out, but considering his work in the past, I'll take fine mediocrity any day. I will give the man credit, he knows how to create an unrelenting sense of dread. And the writing is almost perfect, in the sense that it's a curious blend of fast-paced as well as slow. The film wastes no time in getting to the meat of the story, but within that time, we quickly know who these characters are and what they're about. It's unnerving, intriguing, and plays out exactly as it realistically would. Are these four strangers crazy? Are they faking it and just forcing this nice family into a sick game? The questions are numerous and most of them are answered. 
apart from some notable ones. To sum it up, the strangers say what the rules are, but don't explain the consequences if those rules are broken. If the family refuses to kill the other, then one of the strangers has to be sacrificed by the other strangers, causing one of the four plagues. One question that isn't answered is what happens if they don't sacrifice themselves? No one's allowed to off themselves, so what happens if they do? These questions aren't answered and feel like they should be, but I guess the story develops just fine without it and isn't supposed to be what audiences take away, so it opts for a just go with it kind of approach. I love the acting from everyone, they're awesome. The writing, the weight of the characters' actions, it's damn solid. Where it starts to lose me is toward the second half when the family finally gets free and fights back where things stop feeling real. Without giving anything away, its own rules seem to be broken, but is never truly addressed. If what I hear about the book is true, then this is baffling, because from what I understand, the ending of the book feels more like a Shyamalan ending than the actual ending in this movie. <laughs> it's alright. The acting and atmosphere definitely save it, but it gets a bit dumb in the second half. It's a hard recommendation, so take it for what you will. My honest rating for Knock at the Cabin, a 3 out of 5. Just walk out and see. Nothing will happen. None of this can stop until you make a choice. Don't you get that already? <laughs> Ron, Snipe. Ron, Severus Ron, Snipe. Weasley, Snipe. Ron, Snipe. Ron, Snipe. Ron, Severus Snipe. I'm sorry, I had to. I know a sight that will make you scream. I want to die on Halloween. Alexander Skarsgård is a failed writer on vacation with his wife. He meets some new friends and accidentally runs over an innocent person. He allows himself to be cloned and the clone to be punished and killed on his behalf, and then indulges in other insane activities. It will also maintain your memories, and so it will believe itself to be guilty of your crimes at the time of death. Uh, and the award for the most pretentious movie of the year goes to... <sighs> I had such high hopes for this, I'm not gonna lie. Mostly because I like the two leads, Skarsgård and Mia Goth. But this was such a chore to sit through. I have no idea what the hell this movie was. Surface level thoughts make me think it's an allegory for overindulgence in vices, but hell if I know if I'm on the right track. I also don't care if I am. Even if someone held my hand and walked me through what everything meant, it wouldn't matter because the flick is remarkably unpleasant to watch. Where it starts pretty derivative, being a knockoff I know what you did last summer, it spirals into some sci-fi psychological horror that shoves its head so far up its own ass and inhales its own farts like it's hookah. Not a single character acts or speaks like a normal person. I get that's the point. These people are psychotic and posh. Cool. But main character James never seems to make his situation any better when he's clearly distraught and wants out. At least later on when he's clearly had enough with all this craziness. One scene in particular drove me absolutely mad. At a certain point, I became so numb to what I perceived to be shock value that I no longer cared about all the twists and turns. I just wanted it to be over. And while both Skarsgård and Goth have proven to be phenomenal actors in the past, Goth being a modern horror queen, especially when it came to last year's Pearl, but dear Christ, she went way too far here to the point where she would have been better if she was a cartoon character. I swear, when the credits rolled, I'd never been so happy in my life. I don't know what this movie was going for, and I don't care. If you know what's going on, good for you. I've been accused of a lot of things, but being overly analytical is not one of them. Being smart ain't one of them. But I know what I like, and I sure as hell didn't like this. Never again. My honest rating for Infinity Pool, a 1 out of 5. Yeah, Jay-Z! Come on! <laughs> when we off dead, when we wake the sky turns red. Caitlin Deaver is a young woman living alone and ostracized by the small town she lives in due to a dark past. When aliens invade her home, she can't rely on anyone to save her. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh my god, this deserves its own dedicated review. This was fan freaking tastic. Almost perfect in so many ways. It kind of loses me in some areas, but man, this was awesome! What makes this film so unique is that it only has five lines of dialogue in its entire 90 minute runtime. Debatably seven. But so much gets across in this textbook example of showing, not telling. You know she lives alone and is shunned by the people of the town she lives in for unknown reasons, involving some dead girl. Immediately, Deaver commands the screen. She's charming, you feel for her, and feel a complete sense of isolation. As Deaver isn't exactly built like an action hero, the sense of danger when the aliens show up makes you so scared for her. Speaking of the aliens, I can't believe how well they worked out. Admittedly, the alien designs are your prototypical aliens, and the special effects can be a little wonky at times. But more often than not, the uncanny valley works in its favor as these dudes are too witchy. It's so creepy how they move. Their expressionless eyes, their unknowable spoken and body language. There's not one second where you aren't deathly afraid of these things. And the enemy variety is surprisingly effective as you have man-sized ones, small ones with long ass arms, and huge ones. Even when she resorts to holding up in her home to fight back and it kind of becomes an action movie, it really works as her means of defense are simple yet effective and makes her all the more badass, and certain moments had me audibly cheering. It's around the three quarter mark where things start to stop making sense, and there are certain artistic choices that I feel like would have been better suited later on in the story, but this was so good! A mishmash of signs, invasion of the body snatchers, I saw one reviewer say home alone, yeah that's fair, but it all just mixes so well together. I'm with Stephen King on this one. If you have Hulu, you gotta check this out, man. My honest rating for No One Will Save You, a strong four out of five. <laughs> there is no way to leave this room. Put on a hat and strap on a broom. Two young girls go missing for three days. When they return, they are both possessed by the same demonic entity. Unable to help through conventional means, help is sought by Ellen Burstyn. Leave me alone now. It's okay. I'm with it for the first two acts, despite it being your prototypical demonic possession fair. But as soon as the third act comes around, then it spirals into nonsense. The movie certainly gives Leslie Odom Jr. a lot to work with in terms of his character, having lost his wife in order to save his daughter at birth. I was with his desperation to find her when she went missing, trying to figure out every conceivable possibility as to why she disappeared, even going so far as to accuse the parents of the other girl being indirectly responsible. And when they get back, things get creepy. I was squeamish around the graphic body harm, like peeled back toenails, the demonic behavior when one of the girls is in church. I love demonic beings that aren't afraid to show themselves to the public. The acting from the two girls, Lydia Jewett and Olivia O'Neill, is really good. Combined with their grotesque makeup, they truly steal the show. And I enjoy the idea that it's not just Christian exorcism that's going to save the day, but reliance on other religious practices as well. However, that's where the movie falls short. Good ideas aplenty, but weak-ass execution. The fact that two girls are possessed means nothing. They don't do anything all that terrorizing together. A part, sure, but it ends up being a gimmick. Write it out of the story and keep the focus on one kid, you miss nothing. The same goes for the utilization of other exorcisms from other cultures. Only one is used, and it doesn't seem to have any real effect in the climax. Once again, write it out, you miss nothing. And finally, the title is misleading. There's no central exorcist. It's all the parents and some other Christian believers that band together. I think anyone's enjoyment of this is going to depend entirely on how you feel about the original. I personally didn't care for it, and that's going to explain why I'm pretty lenient toward this. It's getting roasted by critics online. So I imagine that if you're a fan of the original, 
This is probably more blasphemous than any upside down crucifix. But as it stands, I don't agree with the overwhelming critical hatred. But I do get why I might be in the minority of those that mm, will tolerate it. I don't love this. So, is it worth seeing? I don't know. If you're not a horror movie fan, this isn't going to change your mind. And certainly if you're a fan of the original, definitely not. I think it's worth it if it's like treat it as a date movie maybe, but definitely don't rush out to theaters to see it. Wait until streaming. My honest rating for The Exorcist Believer, a three out of five. The body in the blood! The body in the blood! The body in the blood! Enough! The body in the blood! Stop it! The body in the blood! <laughs> Thanks for joining me on my Halloween special, guys. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Now get out there, get some candy, rot your teeth, and hope to see you soon. Halloween. Halloween.